Good afternoon. It's Jeff Christian. It's Tuesday, the 5th of October, about 1.48 uh, p.m. I'm going to talk to you today about the markets, current market views, uh, where we think it's going. Uh, we've updated some seasonality data uh, charts, uh, and they aren't surprising what they're showing, but they might be interesting to you. And then I'll talk a little bit about some work that we've done on when trading actually occurs, uh, which delves into some of the conspiracy theories, I guess. So precious metals, you know, gold and silver have been hit hard over the last week or so, uh, but they haven't been alone. So whatever is happening clearly is exogenous to gold and silver, and it's a more broader issue. Uh, you've seen commodities across the board fall with the exception of oil. Oil's rising because of issues that are quite specific to the oil market, including issues in the UK. Um, but um, financial markets, equities, stocks, bonds, currencies, uh, precious metals, other commodities have all shown weakness. Uh, our view is still that what we're seeing is all of these markets are adjusting to a new uh, fin uh, monetary policy regime uh, with a shift in, at the Fed primarily toward less accommodation, starting to draw down some of the uh, bond portfolio that it, uh, it has, bond purchases that it has, and also pointing to the idea that interest rates might rise modestly. Uh, and even a modest increase in price, uh, interest rates could have an effect more so on stocks than on precious metals. So we think that that's what's going on. Uh, I've talked about it in the past that we're concerned, you know, we've seen this situation over the last two years where gold and silver rise to a peak in early August and then declined really for the rest of the year. Happened in 2019, happened again in 2020. We saw uh, gold and silver rise again this year in the middle of the year. They've come off since then and the question is, do they continue to be weak for the rest of the year, or do they uh, rise modestly, or do they just tread water, uh, and what goes on beyond? Our view is still that the prices probably will move broadly sideways. We're a little bit surprised at the weakness that we've seen uh, in September, uh, but our view is that they probably will move pretty much broadly uh, sideways for the next three months. as the new monetary regime uh, is more fully digested by institutional investors and others in the market. Uh, and then we'll see a modest increase in prices in over the course of 22 with a uh, possibility of larger price moves 2023, 2025, depending on how the global economy, the national economy, and the uh, political environment shake out. We've updated our gold and silver uh, seasonality calculations. The chart on the left is the old uh, chart that we used, which did not include um, patterns in 2019 and 2020. And you can see traditionally with gold prices, they fell in, you know, really, well, from the second quarter through June, July, August, then they rose back in September and they were stronger for the rest of the year. The chart on the left, on the right, shows uh, updated seasonality calculations um, that include 2019 and 2020, where we've seen this pattern where prices spiked higher in August and uh, then dissipate over the course of the last four months of the year. I will point out that the program that we use to calculate seasonality adjusts to give greater weighting to more recent uh, prices. But the interesting thing is, yes, we now have an even stronger uh, seasonal impetus to our higher prices in September, and then they fall, and they fall much more sharply October, November, December. So that sort of suggests that the gold price may remain under pressure for the fourth quarter. Um, as um, fabricators might buy more metal in September and October and less metal in November and December than they had in previous periods of time. Uh, 
we saw a similar relationship in si silver. And again, you can see silver prices would fall from May into August, and then they rise in September and stay relatively strong uh, compared to July and August uh, in in the fourth quarter, October, November, and December, before rising uh, in the first five months of the year. The new calculations, including 2019 and 2020, show much greater strength in January and February, specifically February, and then weaker performance March, April, May, uh, which is a little bit interesting. It, it suggests a slight change in fabricators and investor patterns uh, toward, toward silver. Again, the prices fall into July uh, in the new cal calculations. It shows some strength in August, peak again in September, and then our week, October, November, December. So uh, given that September saw weak gold prices and silver prices, it's a little bit worrisome as to what uh, may happen over the fourth quarter. We still think that there is a something of a solid base. We expect investment demand to be relatively healthy in part because prices will be lower and there'll be any number of investors who say, I actually like to buy low and sell high. Uh, so that might, you know, we might see stronger investment buying in the fourth quarter than we otherwise would have seen, but probably possibly not enough to really drive the prices sharply higher. We had been saying that we thought that, you know, silver would trade between say 22 and $28 during this period of time. We're still saying that. Uh, the price fell below $22 uh, last week, uh, and we were a little bit surprised at the strength of the selling that pushed that. Um, and um, gold, we were we've been looking at a, a price range. Yeah, yeah, a possibility of a spike down to 1680, but probably we had been thinking 1740 or so was the support level, uh, and that there was some scope for rising prices. Uh, we still think that's true, uh, although the, clearly the markets are a little bit weaker. I wanted to talk about one last thing. You know, in our Friday video, E commented that I conveniently ignore that fact that many of the smackdowns, as he calls them, occur when the major markets are closed, and there are no similar smackups when the major markets are closed. The problem. Yeah, Bernard Baruch said, every person is entitled to their opinions, but no one has the right to be wrong in their facts. And facts just get in the way of belief so often. I'm sorry. Reality, you know, looking at the recent statistical work that we were doing, 92% or 90 of the 98 periods, 10 minute periods, where we saw unusually large trading volumes on the COMEX silver contract. January and February of this year, 92% of the time, 90 out of 98%, 98 incidents occurred in New York trading hours. Now, maybe he's right, but he's thinking about the wrong periods of time. The reality is that a lot of the periods when you see larger than usual, third standard deviation or greater uh, uh, volumes and falling prices. Actually, the vast majority of those times occur during North American trading hours. Uh, eight times occurred in Asia. And it's fine. So, well, you know, the, those eight times were the smackdowns by the banks and everything else was just normal trading. Yeah, it kind of defies logic. It's not critical thinking, that's for sure. Not looking at the data and saying, hmm, Let's look at what the data actually shows. The other thing is that they say, oh, well, this is when major markets are closed or major markets are illiquid or the COMEX is illiquid trading period. It's not the case. China and India are the largest markets for gold and silver and have been for, for, for many, many, many years. They continue to be. The major markets are actually open during those hours not closed. Third thing is, oh, no smack ups occur. In that sampling, there were 16 periods of time, 10 minute periods of time, where there was 
more than two standard deviations tr uh, increase in trading volume, uh, heavy trading volume, and the price of silver rose. Of those 16 times, half of them actually occurred in Asian trading hours as opposed to North American trading hours. So it's one thing to have a belief. It's another thing to have a belief that flies in the face of statistics and reality. And it's another thing to be able to say, gee, I think my belief is wrong. And the final thing is, and I, I actually, I don't know that I've ever mentioned this, not the banks that are the largest traders. The large trading trades that tend to occur across commodities tend not to come from banks, but from institutional investors, asset management companies. Uh, now, the conflict entrepreneurs and conflict addicts will t tell you that all of this is wrong and I'm, I'm, I'm splicing the data and I'm looking at all of this other data to obfuscate those one or two instances that they've picked out that support their theories. But that's what conflict entrepreneurs and conflict addicts do. Research people look at all of the data, they study the trading patterns, and they say, oh, okay, this is what I'm seeing. Nothing here that suggests or supports any concept of large banks coming in and illiquid Asian trading hours and smashing the market down. So please, if you have those beliefs, keep them to yourselves. Don't share them with me. I'm really busy with the real market. And don't share them with other people who may believe what you're saying and get their investments wrong and lose money. Okay, that's real research. Again, you can come to our website. There's all kinds of things that you can read about, uh, free reads and such. You can learn about our retail investment program. Uh, you can read about all of the work that we're doing there. And I'll talk to you on Friday.